Hi there, hello everyone, and welcome back to this tutorial series. Um, first of all, let me get one thing out of the way, the big elephant in the room. Um, I've been on a hiatus for quite some time now. I haven't posted anything in literally months. And I'm sorry about that. That's not cool. But uh, I want to get back to it. I want to get back to working on this channel. I've just been busy with mostly work related stuff and some personal projects things like that I don't want to get into it too much but I haven't really found the time and or motivation to work on this channel but uh, I want to change that I want to get back to working on it and uh, yeah we start off with uh, a new episode of this tutorial series I hope you enjoy it and also a big thank you to everyone first of all for being patient but second of all for subscribing to this channel um, we're now at over 350 subscribers and that's a huge deal to me. Thank you so much. Please enjoy the video. I'm happy with it. So, what else? Oh, yeah, one more thing. We forgot that um, a sound effect should be played when we run into an obstacle. As soon as we run into an obstacle, it actually plays a little sound effect. There. Uh, yeah, and we want to do that too, of course, and we do have that sound effect as an asset. So let's see. Where do we want to play that sound effect? We can either have it played in the uh, die method of the T-Rex, uh, we may as well play it in the um, collision detection method of the obstacle or we can play it in the um, in this event handler method here in the t-rex died method in the game class it doesn't really matter it won't make a difference um, I guess we will we'll just play it right here So da, da, da. did we actually already load the sound effect? Yes, we did. SFX hit is the name of the field. So let's go down here into the T-Rex died event handler method and let's say SFX hit play. And that'll be that. It's really that easy. Now, let's start up the game again and purposely run into the next obstacle. There we go. Perfect. What was that? Why was it played again? Huh? Why is it playing twice? Let me check something here. I feel like for some reason this uh, method is called twice. Not sure why yet. But uh, we can test that by saying debug right line uh, game over, something like that. So this will print the text here, game over, to the debug console. And that way we can check if the method is called multiple times. Uh, I guess it's down here, output. Game over. Game over. Yeah, it's actually called twice for some reason. There we go, it's called. Now I click the button. And it's called again. There, it's called. And it's called again. Why? Okay, uh, sorry, I had to make a quick cut here just to sort of check what's going on. And yeah, the... Um, Solution is quite simple. 
um, in the um, obstacle manager, we do remove the uh, obstacles from the entity manager, but remember they are not removed instantly. Um, they they are put into a list of entities to remove, and then later uh, removed later. Um, let me go back into the entity manager here. So if we call remove entity, um, we add the entity to a list of entities to remove. And then in the update method here, we, we uh, remove the entity uh, here, down here, uh, from the list of entities by um, iterating over the ent entities to remove and then calling the remove method of the entities list. And I guess uh, there is one frame after removing after putting the entity in this list of entities to remove where it is still updated. So in order to fix that, um, let's go here and say um, for each entity in entities, uh, in this for each loop, we will have another check here. Uh, if entities to remove contains this entity, we will simply skip this entity and not update it. I think this is the problem. Let me test that. So let's run into it and click the button. Yeah, that was it. Now it's not playing the sound twice. So really what was going on here is that there's uh, a short period uh, to be precise it's one frame uh, there's a there's a period of except exactly one frame where the obstacle is was queued to be removed but it's not actually removed yet so it was still updated so in that one frame uh, the collision uh, was still detected and still handled so yeah uh, I forgot to um, to take care of that here in the entity manager. So make sure you add this line here in the update method of the entity manager. So uh, yeah, that should take care of that. Let me just start up the game again here and take a brief look at what we got here. That's fine. Yeah, looks great. And like I said, I will just uh, leave this in, this uh, game over message in the um, debug output. I mean, there's no reason to remove it. It's fine. Um, yeah. Uh, now we uh, said that we also want to reset the ground manager, so let's do that. Uh, let's go here into the ground manager class, and let's see. What do we need to do in order to put it back into its initial state? Mm -hmm. I guess we can simply call the initialize method because that will remove all ground tiles, then create the regular ground tile, add it back in, and add it as an entity. But um, actually what we need to do is we need to make sure that before we add the ground tile here, um, we need to make sure that um, we get rid all of the uh, get rid of all of the already existing ground tiles in the entity manager. So let me go here and say um, for each ground tile, uh, let's just call it GT. 
in uh, entity manager get entities of type ground tile so we get all of the ground tile entities that are currently present in the entity manager and we get rid of them um, by simply calling the remove entity method and passing the entity to it so now when we call the initialize method of the ground manager actually we will first make sure that all ground tile entities will be removed from the entity manager um, and the rest of the pre-existing logic should actually take care of resetting the ground manager to its initial state so we don't actually need a new method for that let's go into the t-rex runner game class and let's say let's go here and say um mm, ground manager initialize oh no not when it died but when we reset sorry not here here let's start the game and now the ground should actually be reset into its initial state if we click the reset button the replay button hard to tell <laughs> yeah yes it is it is reset right yep that seems to work yeah so at this point we actually have a fully functioning a fully functioning game yeah i'm happy with it um but we also want to uh, make it possible um, to restart the game not only by clicking this button but by also just hitting the space bar um, and I guess also the up key the up arrow key let me check how it's implemented in, in the original let me just run into the next cactus I guess we can actually increase the start speed a little bit in our implementation uh, now let me hit the up key yes the up key also restarts the game. Uh, none of the other arrow keys do. So we can either click here or hit spacebar or the up arrow key. So let's do that in our implementation of the game as well. Mm. Let's go into the game over screen class and let's add a field of type keyboard state call it previous keyboard state go into the update method and then uh, actually get the state of the keyboard the current state like this and then we can say mm, first of all all the way down here let's say previous keyboard state equals keyboard state and then let's say is key pressed is equal to keyboard state is key down keys space or keyboard state 
is key down, uh, keys up. And another local variable was key pressed. Uh, previous keyboard state is key down, keys space, or previous keyboard state is key down, keys up. And then um, let's go. Um, ba -ba -ba. Yeah, um, let's put this in parentheses here so that we can add an, uh, another condition using or, the or operator. So if this condition is met, or uh, was key pressed is false and is key pressed like this. So in the, if in the previous frame, the jump key was not pressed, but it is now in this frame, then that also um, would, uh, yeah, that, that would also uh, lead us to um, call the replay method of the game. So yeah, that'll be that. Let's test that. Yeah, let's run into the cactus and hit space. It works. Uh, yeah, but it seems like that actually triggers the jump. That's kind of weird. Yeah, that's it's not really ideal. See if I um re uh, if I reset the game using the jump button, it actually causes the T Rex to jump. That's not quite ideal. Uh, how can we fix that? Okay, sorry, had to make another quick cut there. Um, but anyway, um, the problem here is that we have two individual classes that um check for the keyboard state um, in its current state and in its previous state independently from uh, one another. Um, so um, a way for us to fix this issue uh, would be to simply for one frame block the input in this input controller um, to basically flush it and um, yeah, skip the handling of the jump button for just one frame. And in order for us to achieve this, I'm going to go into the input controller class here and add a new method. And I'm going to call it um, block input tempo rarely. Uh, and what this will do so it will set it will set a field a boolean field named is blocked is blocked to true and here i'm going to say if is blocked then I will set is blocked back to false and simply return so that the input is not actually processed. Uh, no, actually, we still need to um, set the previous keyboard state. So I guess Let's do it differently. Uh, here, we're going to say if is not blocked, 
then do all of this stuff. I'm going to move it into this if branch here. So if the input is not temporarily blocked, then we will just handle it the way we uh, we did before. And then down here, we're going to say is blocked equals false. So now in our game class, in the replay method, I'm going to go ahead here and say uh, input controller block input temporarily. And I guess this should fix the problem. So let's fire up the game again here. run into an obstacle and then press space yeah it works yep so now if i replay um if i uh, reset the game using the jump button it will not actually cause the t-rex to jump So really what we're doing here is we're um, blocking the input uh, handling logic for just one frame by setting this is blocked uh, field to true. Then here we check. Uh, we only handle the input if the is blocked uh, flag is uh, false. And then at the end of the update method, we always make sure that it's set back to false. So yeah, that bug is also taken care of. Now, um, let's take another brief look at the game and think about what we can do next. Um, so we got the replay button taken care of, the obstacles work, all of the controls work, the score works perfectly fine. Um, we still need to handle the high score and we still need to uh, add the whoops uh, I still feel like the co um, collision is not quite quite perfect yet but it doesn't have to be perfect um, yeah we still need to implement this other obstacle type which is the flying dinosaur the pterodactyl um, so I think that's what we're going to do next. Okay, uh, I just rewatched uh, the footage uh, really quick that I got so far, and um, I noticed there's still some slight bug that we should take care of before we um, implement the other obstacle. Um, and that bug is that if we hold down the jump button while we crash into an obstacle, the uh, game will instantly be restarted and that's because um, here in the game over screen class uh, this condition here will be true um, this one here because in the uh, the previous keyboard state uh, the button will not be pressed but in the current one it is so this condition is met so yeah the game uh, the replay method of the game will be called so that's a bit of a problem uh, not that big a deal but uh, I feel like we should fix it and uh, a way we can achieve this here is we could do a similar thing uh, as we did in the input controller or we could simply say um, we want this uh, we don't actually want to check for a button press, but for a button release. So we could kind of turn this around here. Let's say if the key is not pressed, but it was pressed in the previous frame, that means it has been released, then we want to replay the game. So let's fire up the game again now. Oh. 
Yeah, that works. So now if I hold down the button, if I release it, then it will replay, but uh, that's perfectly fine. I think it's actually handled like that in the original game as well. Um, if I start up the original game here, uh, I think they do it the exact same way. If I crash into, if I run into this obstacle here and I hold down the space bar, nothing happens. And as soon as I release it, it actually restarts the game. So. Uh, yeah, we're actually doing it exactly as in the original now, so even better. So yeah, that's fine. I'm happy with the progress so far. Clicking the button works as well. Great. Okay, so let's go ahead now and implement the pterodactyl uh, obstacle. Okay, so let's um, create a new class here in the entities folder. Add class. And let's name it uh, flying dino. Much easier to spell than pterodactyl. Um, okay, and this new class um, as described in our diagram here is also a subclass of the obstacle class so let's go ahead and say inherits from obstacle and then obviously um, we need to actually implement uh, those abstract members of the obstacle class and also create a constructor um, that calls the base constructor. Uh, for now, let's use this stub here and we can also go ahead, right click here and say, generate constructor. There we go. Now we'll actually move that down here like this. So yeah, let's see. What do we need for this new kind of obstacle? Um, I would like to take a look at the original game first because I'm pretty sure that those pterodactyls don't spawn until a certain score has been reached. Um, and also I want to take a brief look at the animation, uh, how fast the animation of them actually plays um, things like that so let's go ahead and check that out so initially uh, the game won't spawn any pterodactyls I'm pretty sure of that and at some point they just start spawning there's one we're at I guess we were at about 150 points yeah we're just gonna say that um, as soon as uh, we've reached 150 points, uh, the game can spawn these flying dino obstacles. Um, let's already define that. Uh, let's go into the obstacle manager class here. Go up here to the constant definitions and say, private constant int um, say flying dino spawn score min 150 so we have to have a minimum score of 150 in order for the obstacle manager to start spawning uh, this new obstacle type. Okay, so obviously the um, pterodactyl is actually animated, so we need a sprite animation. So we can use our sprite animation class for that. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and create a field, private sprite animation, and just call it animation since there are no different, it's not going to be a different types of uh, animations for this uh, character here. So let's just call it animation. And we need to pass the texture here to the constructor. So let's add it here. Texture to D, sprite sheet. And then we need to construct an instance of the sprite animation. Uh, so let's see. Let's take a look at the sprite sheet here. And there it is already. And it's really just these two frames that need to uh, play over and over in a loop. So let's see. Let's check out the coordinates and the width and the height. This seems about right. Uh, width is 46. Let me move it 46 pixels to the right. Yeah, that is definitely correct. So, um, the coordinates are 134 and 0. Width is 46, height is 42. Uh, texture chords X is 134 and texture chords Y is 0 then the sprite width is 46 and the height is 42 so height 42 okay and we can use these values now to actually create an instance of the sprite animation um, for that we need two sprites uh, let's say sprite a new sprite And here we can pass the sprite sheet. The x coordinate is simply the constant value texture chords x, and then texture chords y for the y component. Then the width is sprite width and sprite height. And then we need another sprite. Call it sprite B, new sprite, pass the sprite sheet. The X position will be the texture chords X plus the sprite width. The Y position will be the same. And the width and height will also be the same. There we go. And now we can use these two sprite instances to create an animation. Uh, let's say animation equals new sprite animation and then we can say add frame uh, sprite a the timestamp will be zero then add another frame with sprite b and now, yeah, we kind of need to uh, define a speed at which this animation should play. Um, let's say, I don't know. Let's take a look at our T-Rex class, how we implemented it there. Um, whoops, there. I guess we had a, oh, here. Add frame, blah blah. Frame length is uh, point 0.1. Mm, and I guess 
the run animation of the T-Rex is actually a little faster than the wing flapping animation of the pterodactyl. So let's say uh, point 0.2 for now, and then we can test it. Animation frame length 0.2f. There we go. And I will pass that here. And then we need another frame, which is basically just a dummy, um, to indicate the end of the animation. And we will just use um, sprite A again here. And as the timestamp, we will pass animation frame length multiplied by 2. And then we need the anime um, set the oops should loop um, property to true so that it actually runs repeatedly. Um, and I guess we guess we can just call the play method directly because it will always play this. Uh, there will never be a reason to make it stop playing. Um, or actually there is. In the game, uh, when we run into an obstacle uh, and the game over screen is showing, I guess we no longer want to play the animation. Um, we have to we have to stop the animation as soon as the game over screen is showing but yeah let's take care of that uh, later um, for now we need to um, override the collision box uh, property here, the getter. Um, currently it's throwing a not implemented exception. That's uh, of course not what we want. Um, let's say Something like this. And the width will be, let's say, the sprite width minus, oh no, we can't say. Let me just pass the sprite width and sprite height here. And then adjust that a little bit. I'm going to right click here, quick actions, use block body to convert it into a block body syntax. And then here again, I'm going to store that collision box in a local variable. And then call the inflate method again here. Uh, it seems like we're actually repeating ourselves. We're kind of violating the dry principle here. But I do want to uh, have different implementations of collision box for each uh, concrete obstacle here because the, um, the inset here of the collision box might be a little different for the um, pterodactyl actually than it is for the cacti. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will end up being slightly different. So um, let's go ahead here and say um, vertical collision inset is uh, three or four. And horizontal collision inset is uh, three. 
Oops. No, actually, let's say. Hmm. Because I don't want this collision box to be that large. It's probably going to be a problem. Uh, because we need to be able to duck under the pterodactyl. Uh, I really want the collision box for, for the pterodactyl to be rather small. So let's say here inset is 6 and here it is 4. Or maybe even smaller. Let's say 8 and 6 for now. Pass these values here. Like this. And this will make the uh, collision box smaller. Actually, uh, if I call it like this, it will actually make it bigger. I have to put a minus operator before each of those values. Like this. So this will make the collision box slightly smaller. And um, yeah, we're going to have to play around with these values a little bit uh, again later on. But uh, for now, this should be okay. Uh, and yeah, let's see. Oh, I guess we need to be able to override the update method here. Um, because uh, we need to update the animation each frame and we haven't made the um, the base classes update method virtual if we go here into the um, obstacle class go to definition um, the update method is not virtual that means we cannot override it in subclasses but we need to uh, so let's make it virtual and now we can override it here Let's say public override and here we can just use IntelliSense like this public override void update um, and the first thing we want to do is call the base implementation of the update method so the uh, implementation of the update method in the obstacle class and then we want to additionally uh, update the animation and pass the game time like this. But remember, we don't want the animation to play when the game over screen is showing, I guess. I don't know how it's handled in the original. Let's actually take a look at that first. Okay, no, another quick cut here. Um, I played the game for a while, the original game. And yes, definitely, um, as soon as the game over screen is shown, the animation of the pterodactyls uh, definitely stops playing um, so we can implement that pretty easily here uh, simply by saying if t-rex oh, mm, oh I guess we don't have we don't actually have access to that t-rex field because it's private Let's see. Let's go into the um, obstacle class. Yes, the T-Rex field is um, private, so we it's not visible to us in the flying dino class. Um, but we can either go ahead here and make it protected, um, or we could add a, pro a protected property to return uh, the T-Rex which would also be fine or we could go ahead and define a new private field here and simply use the t-rex instance that is passed here um, that would be fine as well um, yeah I guess we can do that since um, there's no reason for us to um, change the obstacle class itself i guess we can just go ahead here and say private t-rex t-rex 
and this will not override or hide um, the inherited member uh, of the same name because uh, it's not visible to us. So let's go ahead here in the constructor and say T-Rex equals T-Rex. And then down here we can say if T-Rex uh, is alive, then we want to update then we want to update the animation, otherwise we're just not gonna call the update method. So that way the animation will stop playing as soon as the T-Rex is dead. Okay, that's fine. Now let's implement the draw method. Right now it's throwing an exception, which is not what we want. And what do we want to do in the draw method? I guess we simply want to uh, draw the animation to the screen by calling its draw method. Position is simply the position property. That's it. And this position property is inherited from the obstacle class. Um, and that's it. Uh, let's see, what else? Mm, I think that's it. Was actually pretty easily and quickly done. Let's go into the obstacle manager class and uh, actually implement the spawning logic. Uh, 